13 people out of 100 agents are going to make it five years. And I, and I was like, I'm determined I'm going to be in the 13. Hello and welcome to episode 137 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. In today's episode, we are joined by Northern Colorado-based real estate professional and founder of Top Notch Agents, John Holston. After more than 17 years in law enforcement, John decided it was time to stop trading hours for dollars and jump full-time into real estate. To say he found instant success would be an understatement with his 47 closed deals his rookie year. Fast forward more than a decade later, John has reflected on how he managed to find such early success and is sharing those findings with our audience. Throughout our conversation, John breaks down his five keys to new agent success, shares his thoughts on how to choose the right brokerage when you're first getting started, and much more. Now, before we get on to the day's featured interview, make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents Podcast. You can find the show on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and now Amazon Music. Also, if you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with John Holston. There's a ton of great advice packed into this short conversation. And if you're interested in learning more from John and top-notch agents, I've included a link in the episode description. Well, really, the way I like to start everything out is if you could just introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and where you're at in the country. Yeah, for sure. Well, my name is John Holston. Uh, I am located in northern Colorado in the town uh, Fort Collins, uh, which is about 60 miles north of Denver. It's a beautiful community. Um, been in real estate for going on 11 years now. Um, worked at several different brokerages based on what I felt fit me best at that point. Um, had a really successful run to this point and Anticipate that to continue uh, between uh, running a team in Northern Colorado uh, as an active agent. I also do some coaching, uh, which is kind of where I'm transitioning a lot of my activity to. So, um, yeah, just uh, super excited to be here and and uh, see what we can do to help out your folks and keep rolling along. Awesome. Yeah. And you, you, you mentioned that word transition and, you know, uh, your own personal story, you had a lot, you know, you, you transitioned a couple times with your um, careers and, you know, before you got into real estate. So tell me a little bit about your background, uh, you know, even before you got into real estate. Yes, for sure. So I graduated from uh, Colorado state university back in the day. <laughs> it's been a while, uh, early nineties, uh, right out of, uh, school, I went into journalism. So I was in, uh, I was a photographer in Georgia. I was um, also a, a reporter and news anchor in Northern Colorado. Um, did that for four years, uh, four or five years. Uh, at that point, uh, I got married, had a young family and uh, you don't make money. <laughs> and, uh, right. <laughs> Walmart <laughs> when you're starting off. And so um, I was a reporter that covered crime in courts. And so I made a jump over to law enforcement in my town, uh, strictly for the money, <laughs> strictly yeah. for the money. Uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be a really great career. I was there for 17 years. Uh, you know, everything from patrol to a detective uh, to a sergeant, patrol and internal affairs. And so had a pretty colored career there. Um, 17 years in, I started thinking, man, um, I'm trading uh, hours for dollars and the day that I'm done here is the day that I don't have a paycheck anymore and you're really limited in your income and what you can do. Um, you know, everyone's getting paid the same thing, even those who aren't doing much work. And it was just a frustrating thing. And so I wanted to start off, uh, start a business for myself. Honestly, wasn't real sure what I was going to do. I uh, just knew I wanted to do something. So if you would have told me I was going to end up in real estate, I probably would have kind of laughed. But I had a lot of friends and I, I call them my council of 12 and I sat down with 12 friends and I had uh, my detailed business plan on a big chief scratch pad that had, you know, just my pencil writing on it. And I asked them, I went through it and I said, Hey, um, you think this would work? I mean, you think if, you know, and by that time, several people said, I think real estate would work. And I thought, yeah, that'd be, that'd be kind of might be kind of cool. Maybe fits some of my strengths. And so I asked these 12 people, I had 10 of them say, man, I think you should do this. I think 
you're going to regret it if you don't. I had one said, I don't know if you should do this. And one was like, you're a fool if you do this. And kind of with the counsel of the majority there, stepped out, you know, uh, and it, it was really good right off the bat. I've enjoyed it. I think that a lot of that came from uh, being established in my community for almost 30 years at that point, uh, having a lot of contacts, which as you know, is super important to getting rolling and uh, just had some of the, you know, just general characteristics of someone who can do well in the job. And so I think all those things work together. Uh, well, so here I am, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it has been quite the transition and scary at times, but right. uh, overall, I think really good. Yeah. I, you know, obviously uh, looking at, you know, more your profile, just your, your rookie year, you had a great year as well. You, you jumped right in and had, uh, you know, did really well for yourself. Yeah. That first year, um, you know, I, I don't know what the average, I think it's under five, five year first year. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact, <laughs> but you know, I, I walked into my brokerage and, and uh, it was a high performing brokerage. And I said, Hey, just tell me what the pros do. You tell me what the high producers do. And that's what I'm doing. So when it comes to marketing, I'm just going to copy what they do. And I did, you know, I built a contact list. I jumped into marketing to those, that, that, that group and connecting with them regularly every month in one way or another. Uh, my first year I had 40, uh, 47 deals, um, which was, um, I didn't realize at the time now until now, I didn't really realize how fast it was going for me, but um, but it did, it went really well. And I think, I, I think looking back on that now, I, now that I'm, you know, almost 11 years down the road, trying to figure out what, why, I mean, why was that first year and really years subsequent, you know, I mean, I, on average, probably 60 to 65 deals a year as, an, in, as a single agent with an admin. So I don't have, you know, I mean, that's my part. I do have a, a small team that kind of does their own thing and we all work together, but um, yeah, so I think there's some real principles that, that new agents can follow and agents that are struggling and lonely and in their market can do that to really turn things around, which I think is is exciting. We control so much of what our career does. And it's a lot we don't control that we can't worry about, but a lot that we can't. And those are the things we focus on. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'd love to transition our conversation to those things because I think those, those are, uh, you know, so important because, you know, the statistics are crazy. What is it like 87% of people fail out in the first, you know, five years and, you know, right. it, it is difficult and can be really scary to go from having a, you know, a steady paycheck to not knowing when that next, you know, check is going to hit your bank account. Absolutely. And I think part of that is because people go into it not having planned correctly. They think it's an easy job. They think the money's just going to come. People are going to come up to them and say, hey, can you help me buy a house? Doesn't happen. It's just not like that. Yes, some people may do that. Some people you know and are connected with, but that's very, very rare occurrence. And so what do you do to um, you know, really uh, fertilize the group that you're, the people that you know? But there's a lot of people just, they get into it with the wrong expectations. Yeah, 13, 13 people out of 100 agents are going to make it five years. And I, and I was like, I'm determined I'm going to be in the 13. I just, I got to, I had six young kids when I transitioned out of law enforcement into real estate, six kids at home, a wife that stayed home with my kids, not much savings. I cashed in retirement. So I'd have six months of living expenses and some extra to buy a computer and the right phone and some equipment. And I jumped I never did a day of real estate and a day of law enforcement at the same time. Never did that. So it had to work. And if it didn't, I was screwed. I mean, I, that's just the bottom line. So I was very hungry to make it work. Yeah. And so I didn't have the luxury of, of playing around with it. And I think that really helped me, you know, helped me in the end. Yeah. Do you think that that's one of the things that um, can lead to more successes by just, you know, jumping in? full go and wow. not having that kind of transition period where you're almost throttling yourself a bit? Yeah, that's a really good point because I I think that, well, first I say there's really no bad reason to get into real estate as far as, as far as the level someone wants to be. If they want to be a referring agent, you know, where they just find there's some business and hand it off to another agent, and make some money from that, or they want to do it just for their friends and family and themselves, or they want to do it part-time. There's nothing wrong with that, but if you work part-time, you make part-time money. 
And if you're just, you know, not really engaging with it and you're distracted because you're not engaging fully in a full, you know, in a full-time career. So yeah, I I say, you know, if you want to be in full-time real estate and jump in and do it full-time, but don't do it until you have some very specific things in place uh, that are going to help you succeed or else you will end up at the 87. You just will. So, I mean, I think that's the biggest mistake people do is they they get their timing wrong. They jump in full-time head first and then they're out because they can't sustain it. And so, yeah, I think that part-time versus full-time is a is a big deal if you're trying to go full-time but you're not ready and then you get two months in the money hasn't come in now you're looking for a side gig to so you can eat which you have to and you're not focusing on your business and it's just a spiral you know so for sure right uh before you know i really want i'm interested in, in hearing the things that you uh you know kind of have learned and found that you know kind of set yourself up for success but how much of that um, initial planning. You said you had that that scratch pad that you had all these plans on, and then you met with your friends. How much of that was, you know, benefited the success of your early career? I think every one of them. I mean, in fact, really, what I did is I identified those five things after I'd been in the business for a while, and I reverse engineered it and said, "What happened?" Because I didn't know what I was doing when I jumped in. I mean, I honestly didn't. I mean, if I, it, you know, if I looked at it now from the you know, if I was jumping now, I don't know that I would have really, I didn't really understand what I was getting into, but it worked out well. And now I can look back and go, what things did I have in place that helped me succeed? And so I think they all really helped. And I can hit them in like 30 seconds if you want me to, or we can go into them more. But, um, you know, the first thing I did is you, you, you have to know your why, right? I knew my why. Um, and, and I had that organically in place as a, these, all these five were just in place when I started not knowing it. Right. Mm-hmm. Number one, I knew my why, um, I, I had my why down and that's relationship and connecting with people. I love that. I love building mm-hmm. networking, uh, building relationships, authentically caring for people is important to me. And so, uh, you know, money comes and goes, deals come and go, people and relationships are always there. And if that's your motivation, and what happens if money alone, and it has to be part of our motivation because that's how we live, but if money alone is your motivation and you don't get paid for two, three, four months starting off, you're done. You're you're not, your motivation is gone. You know, for me, the relationship piece was huge. So that was my why, know your why. Number two, the importance of having money to get started. So like, you know, I didn't have money in the bank, but I cashed in retirement. I had access to it. Six months worth of living expenses, another three to five thousand dollars to equip yourself with everything you need. I mean, living expenses, uh, business expenses, your rent or mortgage, your gas money, entertainment, food, whatever you need. Make it so that you can focus on your business and not on living. Number three, to have an existing sphere of influence. I had a sphere of influence that was in place. I tell people, I think you should have a good contact list of at least a hundred people before you really jump into it. And what I mean by those 100 people, if you went to the grocery store and you ran into somebody, would you have a conversation with them? Would you talk about their family and their life and everything? If you would, they belong on that list. Have at least 100 people on there because we know statistically in my market, and every market's a little different, in my market, for every name I have on that contact list, I should make $1,500 per year gross commission per household. Okay. Yeah. They're not all going to do real estate, but that's how the numbers all work out. Well, we as realtors know that, you know, if I'm making 1500 per household, I'm going to probably make a third of that is what I'm really going to take home after fees, expenses, taxes, everything. 50000 to live on is okay. You can probably do that getting started and you grow up from there, right? But it's just you've got to have that existing sphere of influence. You're going to be scraping knocking on doors, making calls, nothing wrong with that. But you just understand that just takes time to build that sphere and really grow. Number four, ending up in the right brokerage. You've got to end up in a brokerage. It's going to help you, guide you, mentor you, take care of you, answer questions, have a culture that's outstanding. And number five, be teachable. I say humbly teachable. You don't know crap. You don't. I mean, sorry, you go to, you get your license and the one thing you learn is that you don't know anything about real estate. You've got to learn 
uh, how to do the job. So I say you don't know crap. You know what I mean? And it's like, there's so much to learn and you learn that over time. So that number one, know your why. Number two, have money. Number three, have an existing sphere of influence. Number four, end up in the right brokerage. And number five, be teachable. And I feel like looking back, I was those five things. And that's what really set me off on the right course. For somebody that is, uh, you know, is maybe making a, a change and a, a transition, but uh, part of that transition is also moving markets. So the sphere is a little bit more difficult. Um, Huge. What are some of those things that you can start to do to, you know, get those people into your sphere? That's great. A great question. And I think you just got to become really involved in your community, whether that's first off, have the expectation. This is going to take me time. I mean, it's going to take some time to really get rolling. But these are the things where you get involved in your church, where you get involved. And by the way, I don't market a church. I'm just saying these are just relationships <laughs> that you build. I don't even bring, you know, work up at church, but I'm just saying you build relationships with people. You coach your kids' teams or you get involved in clubs and activities that get you inter interacting with, with people. Um, you know, uh, yeah, just general organizations being involved. But there is a place for door knocking. There's a place for cold calling for some people. Uh, I think a big one for new agents is to work open houses in communities where they haven't been. People say, well, open houses aren't really worth it. Well, you know what? If you don't have a sphere, they're worth it because my very, very first deal came from an open house and I had a big sphere. So open houses do work. Um, you know, you, you do get buyers from open houses. So get out there and work open houses and your brokers are available. If your brokerage doesn't have any available open houses, then find an, find an open house in another brokerage. Call that agent. Say, hey, can I hold it open? Do whatever, but find them. Find ways to interact with people and build that sphere of influence. Just got to do it. You know, and sometimes it's a timing thing. I mean, if you move to a new market and you're going to transition to real estate, well, you know, you depends on on how you want to do your business but sometimes it's like get established in the community get to know people before you pull the trigger on the actual transition so that's another thing you can do but you just got to get to know people and interact with people regularly and once you build that contact list be marketing to them constantly in useful ways not harassing ways and build it that way yeah I really, I like the, uh, the open house idea is great because like you said, uh, when you get in, you don't know a whole lot. And one of those things, you know, some of those things that you don't quite know, is just the, how to interact with people and how to, you know, kind of guide the conversation. And those are all great times to practice that. Even if you're, you know, even if it never turns into a, a deal or a transaction for you, that's all that time that you can practice in a real life situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the important thing to do with your interaction is not be high pressure. That's what I say. Just meet people, interact with them, find out about their family if you can. I mean, just little conversations that pop up, you know, in an open house can be really good, but have something of value that you can offer them, uh, whether it's uh, helping them understand how to to uh, get listings from your, your local MLS. Can we help you with that? You know, do something that's useful with them, but don't feel like you're smothering them. You know, they don't feel like you're solving them. But yeah, absolutely. Learning how to interact with people is just a huge piece. And it's intimidating, right? The very first time I would, it's actually, I said it was, you know, my first deal was from an open house. That was my first open house. So, I mean, this lady walked in and she's like, I want to buy this house. And it freaked me out because I didn't even know how to write a contract. <laughs> you know, so I had to get with my listing broker or my uh, managing broker and work that out. But uh, man, that's huge. Learning how to interact with people in, in a way that's authentic to you and uh, is helpful for others. Yeah. One of the other things you touched on was the uh, the importance of finding the right brokerage. And I think that's massively important. And because I always kind of equate it to, uh, you know, the star athlete. And when they get, you know, so let's use like a, a NFL quarterback. If they're the star in college, a lot of their success is predicated on the team they get drafted by. You know, you can be the superstar, but if you're drafted and you're on a team that doesn't have the resources and doesn't put the time into you, it can be it can be a tough career. It can and and I think the thing that people just want to save money when they're starting off and I get it. And trust me, I get it. I mean, I I didn't have it. 
but my brokerage cost thirty eight thousand a year. The first the first brokerage I got into, and people say that's crazy. Why would you even? Why would you do that when I can go pay five hundred dollars a deal? Well, because the brokerage I went into helped with marketing, had name recognition, they had excellent coaching, they had sales meetings, they had people who would help you. That is worth so much. It's just not even funny. You get into a brokerage that doesn't do anything or just gives you a desk and you have no help, you are you don't know what you're doing. I mean, that's just a really hard place to be. So in my opinion, that brokerage is like a do or die for so many people if they don't have that help and resources and culture to, to really get them off the ground. Because it's like an airplane, right? I mean, you're going in the beginning, you're just like, you're trying to get off the ground. And if you don't have anyone to help you with the fuel, I mean, that's that's a brutal place to be. So I I think that's, like I said, one of the top five reasons people are out is because they, they're not in the right place. Right. How was it, you know, in your own personal experience, what did you do to kind of vet out that brokerage and know this is going to be the right fit for me? So th- that's an interesting question because I spoke to one brokerage because I'd been in the community for a long time and I knew who stood out as the company that did real estate. And so um, it- it's kind of like I did in police work. I interviewed with one police department and I didn't look up a lot of places because I knew where I wanted to live. And so I knew in this case where I, I wanted to go. And so could I have, because that's one thing I encourage people to do is really talk to different brokerages, see what, but if that's a do as I say, not as I do, because right. in my particular situation, I was like, I want to be there. That's where the pros are. That's the high volume. And so mm-hmm. I just jumped in there. I mean, I had conversations with several people to make sure it would be a good fit, but I didn't go to other brokerages. That makes yeah. sense. So um, there are times I think that's good, but I think in general, Unless you have that type of brokerage in your community and you're really drawn to it, you need to do your research. In the culture piece and what does my what are my fees going to and what type of training do you have, what type of mentoring? Because some of these brokerages just want a heartbeat. That's what they want. I love it when a when a brokerage actually turns people down because that yeah. shows that they have a desire to have the right people in the right seats. And so um yeah, talk to these brokerages. Ask them what would, you know, those different questions. And also, why would you not invite someone into your brokerage? You know, ask those questions. So there's just a lot of things you can ask, but just it needs to focus on culture, education, uh, oversight, help that you have, mentoring, all of that. So so my personal experience is maybe a little different than a lot of people's should be. And maybe it should should have been for me. But again, I didn't really know what I was (laughs) doing. Right, right. So, but I mean, you had an idea of what you what you wanted and what you sought out is like those are the guys like that's the group that I see doing the what how I want to have my career be. Exactly. In fact, the name was the group. <laughs> that's <laughs> company I was part of, it. and uh, a lot of people know the group incorporated out in Colorado and and uh, Larry Kendall, who is the founder and an author of the book uh, Ninja Selling, which is a great book. Uh, a lot of people are aware of him, but that was the company, and and I jumped into it, and it was a it was a fantastic decision. I'm not there anymore because I wanted to start building a team. There were other things that were more conducive in a different company, you know. So yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. yeah, it's a huge decision. And the last point you made there was being teachable, and I mean, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna find a mentor to really kind of put the time and effort into you. You've also got to put the effort into absorbing that and put it into practice and actually, and like you said, just be teachable. Right. It, you know, I, I think that unless you put what you learn into action, it's just not, it's not useful. Right. But in order to have things to put into action, you've got to listen. And there's so much, like I said, when we get into this business that we don't know, there's so much we don't know. So look for people you can ask questions. Most people are very, most agents are pretty comfortable just answering your basic questions and helping you learn and just be be open to that. Um, and then put it, put it into place. You know, again, yeah. listen to what the pros do. Listen to what the high volume people do. We do not need to recreate the wheel. We don't need to recreate the wheel. Real estate's not terribly complicated. It's complex at times. 
But if you learn how to do the job and you're teachable and you're humble and you realize that I don't know anything and I need help. And by the way, being being able to go to other agents and say, help me know what I don't know. Help me know what I don't know. Ask the questions and let them walk you through that. But if you're not teachable and just feel like you have the answers or you're not open to doing things a different way, if you learn there's something new you can do, I mean, I think we probably both have the experience where you're trying to help a new agent and they think they know it and they're just going to do it yeah. their own way. And that's fine, but they end up in the 87 a lot of times. So that's that's just the thing is be teachable, be humble, understand that that people know more than you do and listen to that and grow from it and be willing to grow throughout your whole career. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, finding those people that have been through many market shifts and variations and change, because I mean, if you were somebody that got in two and a half years ago, you might be really struggling right now if you aren't teachable and if you aren't willing to, you know, to listen to those other people that are inside of your brokerage. That's yeah, absolutely. Because if you talk to the ones who are in your brokerage, you've been there a long time, they will tell you, don't freak out. I mean, these things come and go. The market's going to come and go. We're going to have really uh, great times and we're not. You know, I mean, I, I look on my own career. There's been, you know, one year where uh, I way blew out what I thought I was going to do, did way better. And the next year was half of that. And I did all the same stuff. It was just a market trend. And that gets scary when you work for yourself, working for yourself, and it gets a little quiet. That's nice for about, two days and you start worrying about it, you know, but when you listen to the voices of other people who've gone before you and realize that, Hey, this is normal or ask them, how did you weather the storm? How did you get through it? And, and really follow that example. It's really good. Yeah, absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit, you are now, you know, when we talk about mentoring and things, that's something that you're obviously really passionate about. Tell me a little bit about top notch and everything you're doing there. Yeah, thanks. So Tom Notch Agents um, came from really, again, a lot of what we talked about this morning or today uh, is understanding kind of where I came from and, and maybe what helped, helped me be successful. And um, I love real estate. I love showing property, writing contracts, all that. But my passion is helping new agents and struggling agents get off the ground and get back going and or getting their career started in the in the right direction. So I created Top Notch Agents to really start filling in uh, some of that opportunity to live out my passion. And it's been been awesome. Topnotchagents.com. We help really primarily new agents who are transitioning from one career into real estate. And there's some very specific things there. Again, it's my story, so that's why I can speak to that. And then uh, agents who are lonely and struggling, uh, I think we're able to really to really help with that. We have what's called a 60-day accelerator. Uh, we want to fully equip new agents and struggling agents in 60 days. Uh, we want to fully equip them. Now, we're not saying you're going to be killing it in 60 days, but you will be equipped to do the job in the right way. And um, it's, it goes for 60 days. Um, they log into their site. They have assignments every day, five days a week. Just do exactly what we tell you to do. Stay with it and you'll be all right. We actually have on the site an assessment um, that we encourage agents to go to. It's a free assessment. We're not going to harass you or anything, but um, just it's a 13-question survey. And if you're struggling or you're getting going, you just answer those 13 questions and we kick out what we feel may be uh, your issue right away. It comes to you instantly and just some some things to work on. So, you know, we're, we're super excited. Uh, it's, it's been great. We're having great results with it. It's just common sense stuff, common sense stuff. And, but at the same time, it's a very, you know how so much coaching is high level and rah, rah, you can do this. Yeah. We're in the weeds. So we are in yeah. the weeds and it's just do these specific things every day and you'll grow a business that's successful. So that's top notch. And we have that class about, uh, about four times a year. We started mm -hmm. up and um, we try to limit it to 10 to 15 agents so we can have that intimate community. We meet every Monday morning uh, and then we have assignments for the week and we have an open office hour later in the week just to be there for the new agents. We can answer a lot of questions and and uh, it's been outstanding. It's been a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, always welcome people to jump on there and check that out see how we can help them out. And uh, it's not for everybody, but it's for a lot of people. So we'll- right. 
see where that goes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And I think, you know, just, um, you know, a story like your own, you had, you know, a long career outside of real estate and then to get in it. And I think it's awesome that you've been able to kind of look back and say, wow, what was it that, you know, how did I get all, have all this success and kind of strip it down to those, to those main points uh, to be able to share with new agents. So I think is, is really awesome and uh, really appreciate you doing that for us. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Appreciate what you guys are doing. I really want to thank John for taking the time to speak with us today. And I think it's awesome that he has reverse engineered his early real estate success and is willing to share his tips with the community. Remember, if you're interested in hearing more from John and Top Notch Agents, I've included a link in the episode description. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message at feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.